Hello, welcome to my website, my Board and Hell website. My name is Laurie Ann Smith. I am a child abuse survivor. I'm also a child abuse prevention public speaker. And uh, thanks for everything you're doing to stop and prevent child abuse. Thanks for caring. Thanks for, for your interest in my story. And uh, I really appreciate it. I appreciate everybody who's taken the time to listen to my shows over the years, since 2009 on Blog Talk Radio. And... Uh, just so many people following my work through the years, and I really appreciate it. So I want to thank you. This is really just a, a little short video I'm doing and uh, called Gratitude. Um, there's so many people in my life, you know, through the years that made such a big difference in my life that, you know, a person sits back and says, you know, at the age of 51, I just turned 51 in December, uh, you know, not knowing how long we have here, you know, on this earth, and to have the opportunity to say thank you, you know, for 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 doing what you did to, to do whatever you could to help me out. Just to be a friend, to be a support. And so this is why I'm doing this video. And hopefully, you know, years down the road or people that can that are in my life right now that can see this, you know, um, hopefully you'll understand um, just what your life meant to me what you meant to me, you know, I didn't take the time when I knew, you know, so many people in my life to tell people what they meant to me, and uh, it's really important to me now, you know, that people would know and understand what they actually meant to me at the time, and as they still do today, what they mean to me now, so, you know, I'll start from the beginning, you know, first of all, I mean, I had some good friends when I was a little kid, and I was really blessed to have one good friend whose name was Arlene Grego, Arlene Rosalie Grego. She was my best friend. Uh, she was I grew up with basically with her on the same street. We spent our whole entire youth together as best friends until she was killed, uh, hit by a car, and uh, at age uh, 17. So I was 15, uh, she was 17, and she was gone out of my life. And she knew I loved her, and she knew that she knew that I cared about her. We were best buddies, and you know she she just loved me unconditionally. You know she just let me hang around her, and you know we weren't in the same grade. She was very much protective of me at school. Um, she knew that I was suffering. She didn't understand the dynamics of abuse, and uh, even when I grew up abused, and I didn't even understand it till much later, um, I was just suffering. You know, and she could see that. She knew. I was having problems at home. She knew I was struggling in school, struggling just to maintain my sanity, really. And she was a comfort to me. She was a, a huge comfort to me. And um, in my teen years, even, you know, before she died, um, we wouldn't even talk that much. You know, she was just such a she was just a comforting presence in my life. And she she very much showed me the love and care that I wasn't getting at home. Desiree came on the scene. Uh, when I was, I believe I was 12 and a half, right around there, Desiree, my good friend Desiree, moved on the block um, on La Vida, and Arlene and Desiree and myself became the Three Amigos, or Three Amigas, and we were best buds, hung out uh, for a few years together. Desiree made a huge impact in my life, as well as her parents. My, her parents actually stepped in, did an intervention for me, uh, when my mom had beaten me with a rolling pin which I described in that video from 13, 14, and go watch that if you want to. Um, they wanted to get the police involved. They wanted to do the whole nine yards, and I did not want to be removed from my home. And um, these people were so helpful to me that I didn't realize until many years later their example, what they had, what they had said to me, what they had meant to me. It really, I consider that... Uh, part of the reason why I'm still here today and so I've had the opportunity to thank to thank them for that which is great and uh, you know even in person so that's awesome um, there's been so many people in my life that helped me out when I really needed help I didn't want to be removed from my home and there were several reasons why one I was I wanted to be uh, I wanted to remain in the home because my mother, my, my, we, our parents were brought up on abuse charges and they almost, we were almost removed from the home. 
and then, uh, but the courts let us stay in the home as long as, you know, my parents had met these criteria, which they didn't do, but we slipped through the cracks. So years later, they wanted to intervene on my behalf. And um, I didn't want to be removed from my home because my mother had was mentally ill and had been abused herself her whole life. She was, she was uh, very manipulative, played many head trip games with everybody around her and kind of made me sort of singled me out to be a black sheep of the family as well as uh, like, you know, I guess my dad and a couple of my brothers. But, you know, I wanted my mom to love me and I wanted to, I knew that if I had been removed and put in foster care, because my mom didn't care if I went to foster care, um, that my mom would have that leverage over me for the rest of my life. She'd be able to say, yeah, I couldn't handle you. You were just this bad kid. You deserved every beating that you got. You deserved everything that you got, and you didn't mean anything to me. And uh, so, therefore, you went to foster care. And then she would say, but not like my, my daughter, Kathy, my daughter, Irene, and my, and my brothers. See, she would have continued to hurt me with that. And I thought, there's no way she's throwing me out of the house, you know. You know, I was, you know, I was a good kid. Um, like I said, is there really a bad kid? You know, they turned bad, right? I was a good kid, and I didn't deserve to be treated like that. Neither did my siblings. And um, my parents never threw my siblings out, except for my mom did make my older brother, who was who was 13 years older than me, she finally did make him move because he had been sexually abusing me for a year. And uh, she knew about it. I told her after the third assault, the third, third sexual assault. And she did finally, after about eight months, buy him a one-way ticket to Canada. But she never threw out any of my other siblings, and they were doing pretty bad stuff. They were stealing from my parents. They were stealing from the neighbors. They were um, stealing from my sister. They were uh, holding a, one of them held a knife to my sister's throat, made her do a drug deal with him, um, just or you know breaking into pharmacy and stuff. Just horrific. They never threw them out, but my mom wanted to throw me out, <laughs> and I was like, no, you're not throwing me out. <laughs> you know, I wanted her to love me. You know, I wanted her to do the right things by me. And so in my heart, that's, that's why I didn't want to be removed from my home. And also to protect my mother from my dad. So there were several reasons why. I think I made the right decision because I finally, at the age of 29, uh, my mom dropped the bomb, the official bomb, that she never wanted any of us. <clears throat> we didn't mean anything to her. Um, she didn't want children. And she didn't care. She never wanted any of us, didn't love us, didn't want us. And, uh, you know, I told her, I said, why didn't you just let us go? You know, when the courts got involved and you guys got busted on child abuse charges, you could have just let us go. Maybe we might have, we, we might have got a good, a good home. Right? My mom was like, you mean nothing to me. So she just wanted to hurt us, hurt me some more, knowing that this would destroy me, right? And so I moved to Canada. But going back to the people in my life from uh, right around uh, well, growing up, uh, it was Arlene Griego really mainly who was responsible for for just being there for me. You know, I can never thank her enough. Desiree and Desiree's parents, BJ and Olin. And, um, and then a different crowd. Actually, after my friend was killed and my good friend Desiree moved away uh, to Oklahoma, a different crowd. I started hanging with a little younger, who I had known forever, for for years on the street. And I'll just give first names, not giving last names. But there was Michelle across the street and her little brother, Don Daniel. Then there was um, Mike and his little brother, Mark. And there was Steve. And there was Robert. And then there was my BFF, my best friend in the whole world, Di. Diana Drums. And her sister, Shannon. And these kids, all a couple years younger, or even two or three years younger than me, or sometimes some of them four years younger than me, made a big difference in my life. I needed a family outside of my family, and they became my family outside of my family. And, uh, you know, we were all just young kids, hanging around, 13, 14, 15, running around. I call us, the, it wasn't just me, we, we had a name, Levita Jubies. <laughs> that was our name.
<laughs> so um, we got into minor trouble, you know, really stupid stuff. We were kind of hurtful to some people, especially me and Diane. We bonded together because we had our issues, you know. We, we thought we were, uh, we were so tough, you know. We were just so tough, right? Which was all a farce, you know. Um, we were just testing our limits, testing the boundaries. And in the meantime, kind of hurt people, you know, Michelle being one of them. And I'm so, uh, really, I mean, uh, uh, Michelle contacted me not too long ago and got in touch with me, which is why I've been able to get in touch with a few more of, the, of my old La Vida Juby friends and uh, said some of the nicest words that anybody's ever said to me before, you know. And, uh, I, you know, I'm glad that I had the opportunity, first of all, to apologize and to take accountability for my behavior, you know, and to let her know that I really did care about her and I loved her dearly. She was a cute little sweet kid from across the street. You know, the whole time I'm growing up being abused, these little kids are across the street and they were sweet to me. They were nice to me, you know, didn't just ignore me or, you know, they weren't mean to me. <clears throat> they were all really, really nice to me, actually. I was the older, I was older than them, but they all, you know, wanted me to come hang out with them. So I owe them a lot. I owe you a lot. So if you happen to be listening to this or watching this, you know, I just thank you from the bottom of my heart for allowing me to hang around with you and uh, and spending time with me and being my friend when I seriously needed friends. I seriously needed somebody in my life, you know. And you guys came in at a time that I can't even explain it. It was just, it's what I needed, you know. I needed a group of people around me who would just bolster me up, you know, and who would support me and just be there for me, you know, accept, accepting me as I was, for who I was. And so, you know, I really appreciate that very much. can't even begin to tell you how much. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, yeah, there was so many. Diane's mom, Sarah, Diane and Shannon's mom, big big huge thank you to her for allowing me first of all to hang around with her daughter uh, my mom didn't want me hanging around with Diane <laughs> my mom just didn't like any of my friends really except for Arlene and really didn't want me hanging around with anybody because she wanted me captive and uh, because I was the last child at home and I was also the only one that she could really control my mother was manic depressive she was narcissistic she was mentally ill and uh, bipolar, you want to call it, and um, with a lot of problems, codependency, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, aggress aggression. She was abused, and she was like, she needed somebody then to take her aggressions out on, and since she was, she heard my dad fought all the time, she couldn't really control that situation, but she could control me, and so she did everything in her power to, uh, basically, I wasn't chained up in the basement, we didn't have a basement, I wasn't chained up in my room either, but she had complete control over me emotionally, psychologically, uh, physically, you know, and she would play me all the time, you know, she would spend time, you know, ignoring me, ignoring my needs, then she would spend time micromanaging every little thing I'm doing and beating me for a look on my face. And so I never, you know, I when I went in the house, every single day I went in the house, if I left the house and I went back in, I never knew what I'd be walking into. And the same, with, and also with the domestic violence. So I, uh, you know, I had to develop a bit of a shell, an outer shell, sort of a hard shell, in order to be able to cope with that. And so um, to a lot of people, I was probably pretty hard, you know, seemed like a hard person, but actually... You know, that was uh, just a protective measure because I was being hurt in my home and I, and I developed a shell so that this outer appearance, the outer Lori that everybody sees outside of my home, uh, it's the tough Lori, you know, the mean Lori, the actual cruel Lori, the jerk, right, the punk. But actually, that was, that was uh, a part of me and I'm, and I'm, I'm not going to deny it. And um, I needed that. I needed to have that. But there was also another part of me that a lot of people didn't get to see, you know, and that's, that's the side that actually has a heart, you know, and cares about people, very much so. Never wanted to hurt anybody. 
and never wanted to cause anybody any pain, any of my friends, anybody I knew. You know, certainly didn't want to cause people trouble or pain or you know sorrow or grief of any kind. You know, and I know I did hurt people, right? But these people, I mean, you people, if you're listening to this, you made a big difference in my life. I appreciate that you let me hang around with you. Thank you very much for doing that. There's so many more. <clears throat> in high school, I also hung around with a couple of these girls who, there was actually three that were uh, complete, uh, I guess, just straight girls, never did drugs, um, came from good homes, mostly. Um, there was Vivian, Stephanie, and Anna. And these girls at school, they were a great support to me in high school because my other friends were going to a different school. And I was um, I was going to high school with these other, with the different high school, <clears throat> and so they became my friends. I was so happy to have them, and um, I kept doing my drugs and drinking in school, and they were straight, but they just thought it was I was a lot of fun to be around. They actually liked me. They sort of took me under their wing. <laughs> it was this party chicken. They were just normal, regular kids going to school, but I think they just thought you know I seriously needed somebody to <laughs> sort of look after me. And they did. They took that role on. And that's awesome. You know, they were my good friends. And I don't know if they'll ever see this, but it doesn't matter. They were very important to me. And I'm thankful they were in my life for as long as they were, which was uh, about four years until I, after I graduated. And we all split off. They went on to college, and I went uh, onto the streets to do more drugs. Um, there were so many people. I mean, there's Susan, my friend Susan, and her mother Mary. Very, very sweet, very sweet friend of mine who would allow me to hang around with her, even knowing that I was a drug user. Now, that's cool. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, who am I? You know, back in those days, I considered myself to be pretty much a punk, you know, headed for a lot of trouble. And this lady, she just took me under her wing, basically, Mary and uh, her daughter, Susan. And Susan became my really good friend, and she is still today. And I thank you, Susan, from the bottom of my heart for being my friend. I seriously needed to have um, an older woman who I could look up to and who would sort of set an example for me, and you did, because your life was just, your life was just, uh, to me, just very pleasant, you know, and it just seemed so, so much better than, than what I was experiencing, and I had something to kind of reach for, like a goal, um, you know, how I would like to be, you know. As, an, as a sort of a little bit older woman, <clears throat> you know, because I, I didn't have much of an example. And so I really appreciate the fact that you let me hang around with you and even had me working for you for a little while. And, um, you know, it was just awesome just to be your friend. It's just that you would allow me to be your friend, that you would be my friend. It's awesome. Tammy Bame, that's another one. Tammy Bame, you know, came into our lives, me and uh, the Libita Jubies, basically. Um, pretty late, you know, in our teens, late teens, 19, 20, and she had a band, and, and she she wanted us to join in and join her band, and my friend played drums, Di, Diana drums, and I played guitar, but I, I wasn't good enough to play in this band, but I did sing backup vocals, and Steve played in, in, in guitar in the band, and there's a few other people, and we had a good time, and we just, you know, we did this one jam session, uh, it was like a little gig that we got for Bella Vista at this, at this restaurant in the mountains in uh, Albuquerque, and we had such a good time, but Tammy, I hung around with her for a little bit. We both, Diana, myself, and, and Steve and stuff, and, you know, <sighs> such a talented, gifted, gifted person. She's an author. She's a writer. I don't even want to say an author because, you know, whatever author, like whatever. Lots of people get stuff published, and it's not that interesting. She's a writer, a real writer, and she writes the most amazing works and poetry, and I never really got to know her as well as I would have liked to. I was too busy doing drugs, unfortunately. But, um, you know, she contacted me years later. We're still back in touch, and it's just awesome to, to, to have her back in my life, you know, even at a later age. It doesn't matter, because I remember singing with her on stage, you know, and I just, I think back about that, and I'm like, we probably could have gone somewhere, you know what I mean? We probably could have made it. She's awesome. So there's so many people I just owe such a huge, a huge amount of gratitude and thank, thankfulness to you. You know, I thank you so much for being there for me, Tammy, allowing me to be in, to be um, just in your life, you know, and that was awesome. You're a good friend, and I'm glad that you looked me up. I'm so glad you found me. I'm so 
happy to be part of your life still. And um, so there's just so many people, you know, that helped me along the way. There's a family that really sort of, um, they were friends with my oldest sister, who was 18 years older than me, who their, the, the mother hung around with my oldest sister. Um, so this woman would be like 18 years older than me. Her daughters um, were a little bit younger than me, and we used to hang out together. And her, she, this woman, um, Chris, she loved my mom, kind of as her mom, right? Because my mom didn't abuse her. <laughs> my mom didn't abuse her. My mom abused Irene, and she abused me. But she didn't abuse this other lady, right? Because this other lady lived, you know, my mom didn't go around abusing the neighborhood kids. <laughs> they all loved her. She used to bake cookies, and, you know, they thought she was great. That's because she, she wasn't beating on them, calling them names and, and psychologically abusing them, emotionally abusing them. So um, lots of people love my mom. That's all right. But anyway, this lady was really responsible for a lot of the most normal stuff that we got to experience in my lifetime. Because without that family around um, sort of taking us in to do normal things, I wouldn't have been able to experience um, much normality um, in my lifetime. And so I owe these people a huge amount of gratitude. That's Chris and Tom and their two daughters, Melissa and Mindy. And without them, our family would have been, I think, even worse than it was. Because at least we had, they were like a glimmer of hope, you know, this family. Um, like a little bit of a ray of sunshine in the darkness. And um, even my mom would say stuff like that, you know. Like, because, you know, we were all suffering. But when we'd go to their house, we were a different family. See? When we, you know, we weren't, my mom wouldn't allow my... Like, my dad had to be quiet the whole time we were over there. He wasn't allowed to say one word. He'd just have to sit on the couch and be quiet. And my mom could just be whoever she wanted to be. She was just the sweet mom. She was the nice lady. She was the nice grandma. She was the nice, you know, older woman who everybody just loved, right? And me, when I went over there, I wasn't allowed to open my mouth either. So I just had to have fun, smile. And so we, we left the abuse in the car is what we did. Because my parents would fight all the way over there to their house for dinner or wherever we were, you know, wherever we were going. And they would fight all the way over there and, or slap me around, whichever, and or both. And then we'd get out of the car and my mom would be like, that's it. They're all putting a smile on your face. We're going in there. We're going to have a good time. That's all there was to it. And that's what we would do. So these people, you know, we love going to their house because it was normal. We'd go there and have fun for a few hours, right? Do the family thing. And then we'd get back in the car and the fight would start again, you know. And sometimes i get slapped in the face, you know. But, I mean, it was just mainly that my parents were fighting all the time. And if I opened my mouth, I generally got backhanded. Or uh, if my parents didn't like something I, I was doing or saying, they'd beat on me. But this family didn't realize, you know, they, they sort of knew what was going on, you know. They, but they blew it off because they loved my mom. That's okay, you know, whatever. You know, it's the issue that they were there in a, you know, as sort of this family that it's almost like a surrogate family for my mom and for me. And I can't really talk for the other people in my family, but I know for us, it made a huge difference in our lives. And, uh, you know, so I, I really thank you for being there for us. You know, it was very much uh, Chris, Chris, the lady who, who, who grew up basically uh, with my sister, Irene, who thought of my mom as a mother, you know, and really loved her because she had problems with her own mom. And so, um, you know, I'm thankful for these people that were in my life. There's so many people. I'm very, very thankful. And so, you know, it's not very often that a person will get to do this and, you know, get to say thank you to a whole lot of people. I'm sure I'm missing somebody there. Um, yeah, I mean, there was just, over the years, so many people that I just have to thank. Um, getting through all of that. Which then sort of helped me out, you know, going through my 20s. You know, I was uh, had a lot of suicidal ideation, really, since I was 10 years old. Um, suicide was always a part of our family. We were always, everybody was talking about it. My dad was threatening to kill us. Uh, my dad attempted to kill me and my sister by driving us over a cliff one time with him. Uh, my dad was always threatening that familicide, family suicide type thing, where he would kill the family and then kill himself. And my mom was always threatening suicide. She was always threatening to kill herself. Or she was threatening to kill me, which quite often she was threatening to kill me, and or kill my dad. Right? And she she never really did the family thing, saying, oh, I'll kill the family. Um, that was all my dad. But she would threaten to kill herself and me, mainly. 
And uh, my brother killed himself. Suicide. Uh, 33 years old. I was 20. He's the one who sexually abused me, Rob. Um, he committed suicide. He had tried several times. And uh, my sister, my oldest sister, Irene, lots of people don't know this, but she was suicidal. And um, also, let's see, was there anybody else in the family? Well, one of my brothers actually died of a suicide, but it was a slow suicide. It was just, uh, he knew one day that the drugs would take him out. He was a pill popper and he overdosed in a shelter on his birthday. So I'm sure, quite sure that it was on purpose. I bet you that was, it was suicide for sure. My mom, my mom wouldn't let him come home and he wanted to come for Christmas, Christmas at our house. Not so much fun, you know, but in his mind, he was thinking, oh, I want to be there with the family, which was what just me and my mom and my dad, you know, family's gone, man. And it never existed. But in his mind, I think he wanted, he was, he was hoping, you know, so here he is at the age of, I was 20, uh, 28, so he would have been, uh, he was seven years old, he would have been 35. So at 35, he's dead in a shelter in uh, in Calgary, 2,000 miles from where we are, on his birthday, just knowing that his mom didn't want him, you know, he abused him, um, you know, horrifically. And uh, it's just, you know, suicide was just part of our existence. My dad was trying to kill himself. He used to run down the freeway naked in the middle of the night, trying to get hit by semi-trucks. And my brothers would have to go out and save him go get him and bring him home and then lock him in his room. My dad was psychologically ill, schizophrenic, um, borderline personality disorder, and who knows what else. Like, he was really messed up. Suicide was an option in our home. And, you know, my sister and I, you know, we always said, oh, we're going to make it. My sister, who's five years older than me, I don't talk to her anymore, but I love her dearly. Um, but I will have nothing to do with her whatsoever. And uh, But I do love her, and her, uh, that's Kathy, the sister closest to me. We said that we were going to we we would be we would be the ones in the family that would make it. We said we'll be the ones that make it. You know we're we'll survive this. You know we're going to do well because uh, you know it was better for us later in life, right? Because uh, the the abuse that was happening right before I was born, up until until the the social workers got involved, was obviously horrific. That's why the social workers got involved. My parents were busted on child abuse charges. So my sister grew up in some of that, but she was very, very young. My brothers were right in the thick of it. They were the ones being abused. And so we always said we would we would be the ones that would make it. We would never try to kill ourselves or try to, you know, just have this or just let, allow ourselves to have this horrible existence or this horrible life. And then uh, so I always thought, you know, this stuff, um, I had that shell there. See, I had that nice little facade that the world sees, right? The world sees this other Lori. Right, that I've created for myself to protect myself. And as I grew up, it changed a little bit, but it just changed a little bit more pleasant so that I could keep a job <laughs> and not get fired for bad behavior. And so, you know, all of a sudden it's like, okay, I'm an adult. I've got this facade. Um, all of this stuff inside of me is um, at some point going to have to come out, you know. And basically that's what happened at the age of like 42. I hit rock bottom and I had again then decided that I was going to end my life, and uh, and uh, I was seriously contemplating suicide. And um, you know, I had been doing this all my life, Grand Canyon at the age of 25, 26 years old, um, and even before that, you know, I didn't care if I lived or died. Um, didn't care if I did too many drugs and overdosed. Didn't care if I wrecked my car, went out in a fireball of some sort. You know, um, you know, no, I I I didn't care. Because that's the pain that I was in was so extreme. But um, at the age of 42, you know, after wanting to self-injure, and, and I did a video on that. You can watch that, 40 to 42. Um, and just getting to, to the very lowest depths of, of the pits of hell that, I could, that I've ever been in. Uh, I decided to live. You know? And that's, that's a decision that was, uh, you know, that's the best thing I could have ever done. I'm very thankful that I stuck it out. And... Really, the reason I'm doing this video here tonight is because the, I would say the main reason why I decided to stick it out is because a whole lot of people planted this, planted this spark of hope, planted this spark of love, planted this spark of, of uh, you know, I guess, uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, strength maybe you know 
in me. And that's all the people that I just mentioned here just now throughout my life, you know, that were there, that planted this spark in me that says, no, you know, I need to keep going. I need to keep, I need to keep doing this. I need to keep, keep going, you know? And so that's why, you know, I'm so glad to be able to do this video here tonight because none of us know how long we have and none of us know how long we're going to be around. And so to be able to, to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for being there for me at a time when I seriously needed you. And you were there right at the right time. So that's the providence of God. And I thank you for, for your friendship, for your love, for your care, for your concern, for showing me that I, that I did count. I did matter. I did matter to you. I did matter to you. You mattered to me. And I couldn't have done it without you. So thanks, everybody. God bless you all. God keep you in the palm of his hand. And until the next time, take good care of yourselves and know that you are in my heart and in my prayers at all times. Talk to you soon.